Up next, we have a panel on DevSecOps. It's called Fast Track to DevSecOps, and we have a great lineup of panelists for this one. First up, we have Yashvir Kosaraju, who works at Twilio and works on all things security. Hey, Yash, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. Good to, good to have you here, Yash. Thank you. Thanks for having me. The next panelist, uh, we have Mike Viscuso, who was the co-founder of Carbon Black. And he should be joining in a minute. Hey, hi, Mike. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, thank you. How are you? I'm pretty good, thanks. Up next, we have John. John is chief architect at Acurix. In the past, he, he co-founded Layered Insight. Let's just wait for him to join. Hey, John, how are you doing today? Hey guys, uh, glad to make it. Uh, Sankit, good to see you. Um, sorry, everyone, uh, Sankit's stumbling a little bit. I restarted my browser right before we started this, so uh, we're, we're good to go. Should be fine. Awesome. So why don't we uh, we jump in? We jump right in. Uh, so we're going to be talking about fast track to DevSecOps, and we have a great bunch of uh, things that I want to talk about. So the first thing, the first question that I want to start off with is, when is it prudent for a, a startup to start introducing security ops in the development, and in, and how early is too early, and when is the ideal time uh, in 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 your experience? Uh, do we need to? Does a early stage startup need to start thinking about it? Um, uh, I think I think I, I want to start with John here. Uh, we can talk about that. Um, always great to be first. So uh, it, I think, in my own personal opinion, there, it's never too early. Uh, I think the question comes down to what do you do about that, right? It's you can start thinking about it and start, you know, there's, I like thinking about architecture in general from a really early age in a startup, you know, what are we building? What type of data are we going to be processing? How are we processing? What are the customers needs going to be like? All these sort of really high level thoughts, not to actually start working on those things immediately, but to get you thinking about it. So, you know, take those things I just mentioned and now bring security into it. Who would want to attack us? Why would they want to attack us? How are they going to attack us? What would they do with the data if they take it from us? So these are, you know, I'm not looking for someone to go and, and spend a ton of money to act or a ton of resources to fix all the world's problems security-wise immediately. But what if, if you're thinking about it when you're writing that SQL statement or you know adding an input field of interface or things like this, it at least sort of gets you a little bit closer you need to be, and I think that's a good thing. And it's cheap to do. Right. Yeah, and uh, and 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 uh, yes, uh, you know, I want to ask this question to you because you know, uh, you know, you work at Twilio, uh, super huge, and you might have had experience with uh, you know uh, getting involved in early stage startups. So, uh, wh what do you think about this? I kind of agree, and just to add on top of it, thinking about architectural issues that may come up in the future, and thinking about stuff that is hard to get right once you scale to a certain size. Um, asset ownership, code ownership, uh, who's responsible for what, what's the security philosophy of the company? Those things are something you should pretty much start early. Uh, you probably don't want to spend a lot of money and resources because as a startup, you're pretty much in a crunch. But thinking about these things, setting a cadence, setting a precedence will help scale uh, the security program and also the sort of security culture in a company. Right. Uh, uh, going to Mike. Uh, Mike, what do you think about it? Uh, of course, uh, you know, Carbon Black is a huge, huge company. So how did you start off? I'm, I'm more interested in learning about how did you start when you were first starting, of course, Carbon Black being a security company itself. So what were, the, some, what were some of the process when did you start introducing it? Yeah, it's a good question. At the risk of three security people telling engineers that they need to think about security um, <laughs> and say, hey, you know, you, you have to start doing it as soon as possible. I think um, both of the other people, John and Yash, actually said, said some things that were really important, which is uh, good security at all levels is really just good hygiene, good hygiene. So if you're an engineer and you're like, okay, do I want to write raw SQL statements to access the database? No, you typically want to put an API in place uh, in front of it. Um, that's just good hygiene. Um, hey, do I want to you know, manually sign all my code before it goes into production? No, I want to make that part of the CI CD pipeline. That's just good hygiene. 
And so I, I think really at the, at the early onset of any good development activity, you start to think of like, all right, we have more than one person touching this code base, even if you're an early stage startup, how are we going to interact to make sure that we're doing things uh, with good hygiene and that we're all doing things similarly? Um, and what you don't realize probably in that moment is that you're actually doing things that are benefiting you from a security perspective. So even if you're not specifically thinking about security, like, oh, I gotta make sure that all this stuff is secure. If you're just having the conversation about what is good practice, what is good hygiene, um, what is the right way to do this? You're probably actually doing something that adheres to good security as well. So I, I would, in fact, think about it and I would focus on it, but I wouldn't get too upset about it. If you're like, oh, man, there's all these security things we're not doing. If you're doing good engineering hygiene, you're probably doing a lot of the things that you're going to need to do to have good security down the road, um, even if you're not specifically labeling them as security uh, improvements. Right. And a follow up question to that. So uh, you said you don't necessarily need to do security uh, explicitly. So what do you think are some of the lowest hanging fruits if for an early stage startup that does not have a lot of resources, maybe uh, not a lot of engineering bandwidth? So in, in your in your uh, recommendation, what would be some of the lowest hanging fruits that 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 uh, in, uh, startups should still uh, uh, focus on in the early days? Yeah, so I, um, this is a great question because any number of us could give any any number of low-hanging fruit. I, I think just to, to start off with a blanket statement is try to remove as many exceptions as you possibly can. So, um, hey, we need to, you know, um, we need to modify this code. Oh, I could just go right onto prod and make that mod right there and reload. Uh, just don't do that. Go through the CI/CD pipeline, create your CI/CD pipeline, follow the rules that you've established with your team every single time. That as soon as you start generating exceptions where it's like, well, we're going to sign this piece of code on our own just because we need to get this thing into production fast and we can't wait the five minutes. As soon as you start doing that, it, it becomes part of the culture. Um, and then that culture is really the hard part to change. The, the, the tooling is not, not that hard to change. The culture is really hard to change. So, I think as a blanket statement, they'll let John and Yash uh, specify some more tactical stuff if they want. But as a blanket statement, I think the big thing to focus on right out of the gate is just, hey, look, what are we going to do every single day, regardless of whether it's two o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon? We're always going to do it this way, and that way we can rely on it. And then we can start to build that pipeline, that CICD CI CD pipeline with all of our other tooling that we need to make sure that we're doing it the right way and we're doing it consistently. But if you start to create these exceptions where you don't actually need to go through the CI CD pipeline in order to get something into prod, or you have a group of people who can just modify configurations on the fly, um, you, you tend to run into a much bigger issue down the road. So I would focus first and foremost on making sure you reduce or completely eliminate if possible uh, any of the exceptions to the rules that you build. Great, uh, that's that's a great answer. Uh, I'm curious to I'm curious to uh, hear from Yash. Uh, what do you think about the the lowest hanging fruits uh, that an early stage startup can still take care of? Uh, I would say having minimal processes around things, right? Uh, versus having no process, and that kind of alludes to the exceptions as well. So if you have a process, then you know how you do certain things and what exceptions would be. So documenting that and making sure you stick to it, uh, even though in the situation you would feel like, okay, let me just do this thing on the side, which uh, you know will become the culture if you let it happen once. Right. Okay. So, so far, the two main points seems to be one consistency in processes and uh, second, having uh, not having a lot of things to, uh, to worry about in terms of processes. John, what do you think about it? Wow. Um, those are both good points. So I think there's a few different ways we can go here. I mean, this question alone right now is, is an hour by itself, right? For all of us to sit and talk. Um, I go in two ways. One, you know, the first thing that hit me up, I'll, I'll come up first. That's supply chain uh, security. So 
pretty much any language that you know Deep's users or any of us are using nowadays, there's some form of third-party libraries we're including. Um, just knowing that you're using an upstate version of that library that doesn't have vulnerabilities in it, that's something that's pretty simple to do, right? Um, there's all some tools we can have out there right now. Deep Source, you know, I'm not going to mention competitors. I'm here, but there's there's many ways it makes it very easy for us to figure out: Are we using something that is um, has a known problem or not? And again, as Michael was saying, that should be part of a CI. The, the reason I'm not starting off with something like talking about that aspect of these things. We're seeing stats recently, 40, 45% of the industry is not using automation in their build. So that's probably more the legacy enterprise companies than it is the people watching the stream in this talk, this talk. But still, that by itself, having the CI process can be a bit of a, a, a stumble for some folks to get over. So while that's something definitely needed, just you know the application you're day in, day out writing from a dev front of view, being able to actually think about what you're using, is when's the last time you checked for that library, um, and, and just sort of I think that becomes part of that base from the previous question. If we're thinking about some of these initial concepts, I haven't said anything about security, right? I haven't actually talked about any type of testing or stuff, right? It's still really basic concepts a developer can do in their own environment. Um, and I think that can help quite a lot. Right, that makes sense. Um, so, and, and you know, uh, it's a nice idea to talk about something else. So. Uh, there have been, uh, you know, I have been reading about offensive strategies in shifting to sec ops, right? So when specifically when when someone starts to when a team starts to build a security team, when a team starts becoming, uh, you know, sufficiently large enough to have a separate security team, um, then a lot of people talk about, hey, how do we build an offensive strategy uh, in sec ops? So if if i am a if uh, you know if i'm a, a early stage startup and i'm reaching that threshold that okay now we can have a full fledged security team how do i start doing that like what are the first things uh, that we can we can do to start moving from not having security to having security as a primary part of our strategy uh, mike do you want to take this <laughs> sure. Uh, I'll start us off. How about that, Sanke? And then, John, when, when you're back on, I'd love to hear more about the 44 or 45% that haven't implemented CI. I, my, <laughs> my premise on that, by the way, is that like that's actually way harder. <laughs> so uh, having a CI CD pipeline is one of those things where it may sound like it's uh, it may sound like it's it's too hard to get started, but once you have one and once you rely on one, you realize that uh, it's actually way easier. It's like way, way easier if you have that pipeline than if you don't. Um, and spending the you know several days, if it takes that long to get it in place, even if you're not fully, fully utilizing it, um, will only make your life easier. Uh, so uh, I'd be interested just to hear the follow-up on that, John. In terms of the... Um, you know, having a full security team and a full security team that's actually participating in the application security process and what can you do? Um, John already mentioned a few things about uh, knowing the, the the composition, so to speak, of your source code and do they have any vulnerabilities? I'll go back and uh, on my hygiene point and basically just say, hey, your legal team's going to want to know what libraries you're using just in terms of licensing restrictions. Um, you're, you're, you should, in fact, know what uh, libraries you're importing because if it comes out that um, that's a restrictive license and you need to pay for it, that could end your company. So, yes, security wants it for vulnerability reasons, but there's also a lot of other reasons why you want to know what, you know, what is in your source code that you're building. Um, so, again, I'll go back to the hygiene point. I think one of the first things that you can do is actually uh, it's, it's a really interesting thing. I I may be a little counterculture on this front, but um, what you do is actually less important than how you do it. Um, and so we, we've seen statistics that say that the relationship between IT and security, uh, in this case, uh, ops and security, is actually a negative relationship over three fourths of the time. Um, and I think every everyone who's ever been in an ops world will say, yeah, we hate security. And anyone who's been in security would say like, those engineers don't know what they're doing. I think the first thing you got to do when you have a full security team is develop that empathy between the operations team, the engineering team, the security team, and 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 actually say like, hey, we're all here trying to do something positive for the company. And 
the first thing that security can do to really mess that up is start to come in and say, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. That just is a surefire way to get yourself cut out of the process altogether. And now you have nothing. And so I think one of the first things, if you're a security team trying to implement yourself in a DevOps culture, is to actually establish that culture. That's a culture of empathy that all three parties are trying to accomplish the same thing. And then be really, really light on what it is that you stop production. So I mentioned the CI CD pipeline. Hey, look, we are not allowing software to go out that has an embedded third, third party library where exploit code is available and actively in use. Like, okay, great. That's something that engineering and ops will say like, okay, we see the, we see the benefit of that. Just that small little thing gets you in the door and keeps that relationship active. So the first thing that you could do is just uh, get the tooling in place for probably a different reason other than security, show the value of other than security, then actually implement your first stop production type thing. Like as the trains move in, uh, security has a very minimal, minimal amount of ability to stop production such that everyone agrees to it. And then use that as your foundation to layer up, layer up, layer up, and try to get a, a little bit more and more and more hygiene over time. But I've seen a lot of DevSecOps teams fail largely because security is going in and trying to accomplish everything on day one. So my advice would be, whatever you do, start small, start with something that has empathy, start with something that everyone can agree. We don't want that, that does not represent the type of company we are the, or, the, or the company, the type of code we wanna produce or showcase to the world, and then use that as your foundation going forward. Right. Starting small uh, uh, and having empathy. I think I think that's a great that's a great point, Mike. And uh, I want to I want to hear what Yash has to say about this. But I have an addendum to that question. Uh, so a lot of DevSecOps has been defined as hey, we are integrating uh, what ops does and what security does and kind of engineering as well. And in a, in an organization like Twilio, uh, which is uh, you know a, a huge amount of huge number of engineers. Um, how did you think about doing this? Like, you know, integrating these practices together. Um, Yash, what has been your experience? So that's like an addendum to uh, the earlier question that, you know, how can a small team get started uh, when they're looking at building their security? Yeah. Cool. So I'll take the first part of it. Uh, things to think about or how you can start off with. I'd say also go on a road show of like what you're trying to do. You don't want to be the person who on day one says you cannot do this. So you build relations, but you also need to make sure that the people that you're working with know what you're trying to accomplish and what the end goal is. You could go to your ops and say, hey, can you please put in tool X into the CI CD pipeline? But be also sure to tell them what that tool does, what that gives the company, and what that ops person is actually achieving by utilizing their precious time in helping you do something that you want to do. So that kind of visibility slash roadshow slash uh, training almost, you want to say, uh, would go a long way in making sure that people understand what you're doing and why you're doing. Uh, coming to your second question, it also helps with scale, right? Uh, we The two kinds of security practices. One where security comes at the end and does their activities and goes to engineering and says fix it, but that doesn't scale at all. In DevSecOps, you want to make sure that you don't even hit production when there are vulnerabilities or bad practices in code. So for us, it was always the matter of scale. How do we move fast? How do we stop vulnerabilities from hitting production or stage or dev even? Uh, almost think of uh, placing guardrails and allowing R&D or engineers to move super fast. That was sort of our motivation to sort of start putting in all of our tooling in the CI CD, making sure the false positive rate is as minimal and we are very, very cautious in what things we block with and what we warn with. Right. Okay, that that's I think I think that's a that's a great uh, that's a great answer, um, and and I think one of the uh, overall uh, themes that I I can I can sense here is having empathy towards the rest of the team, uh, 
you know between the teams if a security team is uh, how the security team is interacting with the rest of the engineering team um, and uh, not blocking things right away and you know having that kind of understanding um, so that's that's a that's a great that's a great answer there um, so and 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 final final question uh, uh, so when when we say fast tracking DevSecOps, and th there is a lot of uh, you know a lot of people have been talking about it, like uh, DevSecOps is like the new uh, the new thing uh, that people are jumping on, right? So it's it's like a very uh, very uh, <laughs> abstract question, but what does that mean? I mean, what does that mean to you uh, when we say, hey, we want to we want to implement DevSecOps now? So systematically, you know, in in, in a very simple term, what does that mean to you? Like John, I want to hear from you. Um, so I'm going to take that and I'm going to wrap something from both what Yash and Mike were saying together, which I think is a really, really core part, which actually answers that question, which is as a, so first, you know, off your previous question, um, and I still have to go back to CICD, let's see how I pulled off. Um, but with this previous question, you know, the way you phrased it, I was going to make a joke around, um, talk about offensiveness in uh, DevSecOps. If I walk into a developer group and say, hi, I'm from security, I'm here to help, um, we're off to a really bad start, right? That, that's Unfortunately, with that on, uh, my people don't have a very good, very positive um, image around a lot of companies. Um, and to go a little bit further on that and sort of bring these things together, there was a blog post about two, three months ago by over at segment.io talking about taking one of his security people, and might be himself, and embedding them into the developer side of the house. Now talk about building empathy. Uh, how can you actually, you know, go on the other side and actually, you know, learn how to code, learn what those pull models look like, doing code reviews, checking in code, actually seeing your bug fixes getting into production, um, and understanding pressure that that particular person is on, and then security comes to them and says, hey, I need your help. So with those two things tying together as I was going to agree with what Mike and Yash were saying, that idea of moving slow to allow others to move fast is really, I think, in a core way what DevSecOps comes to, right? It's um, a lot of us say frequently, DevSecOps is not a tool, right? You don't have a shelf at, at you know, whatever, or a SaaS product. It's something where you have to have that thought process in place, that ability to have empathy for others in the company. Um, and, and sort of switching that through to talk about CICD for a second, I think what you see there is completely agree with what Mike was saying. It, it's completely valuable to have any form of automation which can help you along that process. Uh, at the same time, as I was saying, I think some of those companies are legacy ones which don't have that automation there yet. But uh, I did a blog post a year, year and a half ago talking about if you look at the three large clouders um, and go and find a CICD diagram on their website, there's no mention of security on that thing because it becomes difficult, right? And this comes back to what I was just saying of, of moving fa moving slow to move fast. Uh, so yeah, go and, you know, if I'm thinking about why well, I'm working on a new project, so first thing go do, you know, you know, write some code as I get serious and go do a git init, so I start tracking my changes. And some of that goes into a project on GitHub or GitLab. Um, and as that gets a little more advanced, I'm going to add, you know, Circle CI or one of the other co uh, companies out there in that automation space, um, something from Atlassian or, you know, Amazon, pick your poison. The first thing is just, can I get it to build, right? And then next thing is like, okay, maybe add a linter in and see are there any syntax errors in, in that when I'm doing those. Posts. At some point, I'm going to say, hey, let's maybe start doing build a container image. Uh, and then at some point further, I'm going to say, let's go ahead and automatically deploy this into pick a poison. How about, we'll talk about GCP today. Um, and at some point as I'm going through there, I mentioned linter, but then maybe Maybe, you know, at some point you start doing a, a static code analysis. Uh, you start doing some of these, as I was saying, checking for outdated packages using the Pendabot. So it's a very sort of um, gradual or um, warming the water, not just bringing it to a boil immediately, right? And I think that's sort of what DevSecOps is too. Uh, to hire a DevSecOps person, maybe, probably not initially. So as you're going through this, right, you know, as a developer, what am I doing? Where are my interests? Um, you know, we talked about all these things we've talked about today. Uh, um, SQL injection, don't care about that. And just look at a higher level and what's my design. Um, okay, well, I know my design. I know what I'm thinking about. We're t I've got this one target. Maybe someone is thinking about, um, you know, trying to attack my my website by doing um, some sort of, well, let's SQL injection. Okay, maybe I'm going to get a tool which I put in my CI CD, which goes through and looks at my source code to see if there's any type of SQL injection weaknesses. 
right? So I'm sort of, I come up with the problem, come up with the fix. And you become more sophisticated as you go through that process. And then at some point, yeah, you get a separate stack up person. Um, and then they're running that instead of you. And that sort of, that process sort of builds out. But um, yeah, so t- key takeaways there, automation, good. Um, moving slow, good, allows others to move fast. That's great. Um, and really empathy, that, that's sort of one of the really big things in that space. And I think that it, it's, it can't be talked about enough. Right, automation, good. I totally, totally agree. Uh, <laughs> Mike, you want to take that one? I, I think John nailed it. Um, the DevSecOps is, for me, an acknowledgement that all three are important and necessary. Um, so no matter how you interpret the term DevSecOps, you come away with this feeling like they're all they're part of a triad um, and that they're all important and necessary, um, which goes back to the empathy point earlier. But ultimately, you heard this word a hundred times, uh, and it's speed. Um, it, it, if you're doing DevSecOps properly, the benefit you should get out of it is speed. And it's not just speed like, uh, you know, today's speed. It's like today's speed and this week's speed and this month's speed and this quarter speed and this year speed and allow you to get to the point where you're operating uh, as quickly as somebody like Twilio. Um, so I, I think ultimately uh, when you acknowledge that all three are important and relevant and necessary and uh, what, you, what, you, what, what you ultimately end up getting is that speed. And that's what you should be looking for. Speed, 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 speed. All right. And uh, uh, for the last time, going back to Yash, uh, Yash, what do you think about it? So, so far we have automation good and empathy and moving slow uh, as well. And then Mike uh, said speed, speed, speed. Uh, uh, what, what, what do you think about DevSecOps in, in a nutshell? To add to all of these good points, right? The only thing I would add is like celebrating small wins. Uh, and I think that's important because you're essentially in a DevSecOps process, you're adding friction to engineers and to celebrate those wins and say, look, we did this and this is what we got and make that a process where you add every single tool, slowly make it uh, in a blocking form and then celebrate those wins, that helps keep the momentum going. Right. Uh, one more thing I'd add quickly there is, and something this is, this is something that I've been thinking about. It's very easy to say block on X, Y, Z, and all of these things for engineers. What we do at Twilio is we put those restrictions on the security team's practices first, and then we sort of roll it out to engineering. We kind of make ourselves the scapegoats for our processes and blocks. For example, if there's a container scan and block on X policy being fired, we do it to our tooling first, our code first, and then fine tune it and then see what works, what doesn't work, and then go from there. I think that uh, doubles down on the empathy piece of what we spoke. Right, That's. I think that's a great, uh, uh, the last point, I really like the last point that you first implement things in the security team before asking the rest of the team, the engineering team to implement it. I think that's that kind of rounds up to the empathy, again, as Yash, Yash said, the empathy point. Um, I'm going to pause here and wait for the questions. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can uh, just ask questions on YouTube. So I'm going to pause for a couple of, couple of minutes. Right. I don't think we have any questions. So uh, thanks a lot for, for joining. And thanks a lot for your time, Mike, John, and Yash. Uh, really appreciate it. To our viewers, uh, I'll be back with Paul, uh, Paul Bigger from uh, Dark, and I'll be back with a fireside chat. See you soon.